Good, ya. Uh, thank you to Arina. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Joseph Juan for your time and willingness uh, to share your experience and knowledge with us. Secondly, uh, I also want to say thank you to all of the participants who, who have attended in this guest lecture. The mostly students who attend this lecture are from class inclusive architecture, Bu Arina, ya. Besides, I also saw some lecture also here and uh, postgraduate student, uh, another uh, participant like a uh, practitioner, architect, NGO, and etc. On this occasion, uh, Dr. Joseph Wan will discuss about disability and inclusive design in architecture, education, and practices. Hopefully, this uh, topic will provide input to all to us, especially to solve the problems discussed. May it will be given beneficially also for us. I think that uh, we can get a very nice uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, okay, I think uh, it's not a long speak for me. Uh, I hope we can start uh, with uh, Dr. Joseph Kwan uh, lecture. Please, uh, Bu Alina, I give back uh, the time to you. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bu Dewi. It's a great honor. And uh, Dr. Joseph Kwan, I think uh, this pandemic era is quite, uh, there is a bad things, but also there is good things because right now we can, uh, thank you, Bu Dewi, for giving us opportunity to have uh, a chance to invite a lecturer from, not only from Indonesia, but also from outside Indonesia. And it is quite possible with this Zoom meeting, yeah, Dr. Joseph Kwan. Uh, although we have a very uh, busy schedule, but uh, it is great opportunity for us to have uh, you here. So before we start, uh, please allow me, Dr. Joseph Kwan, for giving a short introduction uh, for our class and for our team members. Uh, I will try, I, I would like to share our slide here. Okay, everyone can see my slide. Just like a quick introduction. So today uh, we have a uh, very special topics and uh, because, because Joseph, Joseph Kwan is a practitioner and I believe that uh, our first meeting was in Ecuador. I was introduced by uh, Victor Peneda and uh, Mbak Risnawati and it is an honor for me to uh, have you here. So this is our team members, uh, Dr. Joseph Pan, uh, we have this class since 2018. So um, this is me. I, I think you, I hope you remember me. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I'm the coordinator and also we have, oh, I'm sorry, the name is not right. So we have Kirami because this is our previous slide. <laughs> we have Kirami and here we had, uh, uh, Sorry, uh, Faiz, Farbila, and also we have Kolintia. I'm so sorry. The name is not right. So we have Kirami and then uh, Farbila, and then we have uh, Kolintia. So this is our team, but uh, not only this team, but we also supported by all our uh, colleagues in the university. So uh, this is our class members, uh, Dr. Joseph Wan, because this is an elective class, we only have maximum 25 students. Wow. But right now we have 20 students. But uh, since the topics of inclusivity, uh, social issue, political issue is quite trend in our department, sometimes if you can see that uh, most of our lecture uh, is attended by, uh, by a lot of uh, participants not only from our class, and we always open our uh, guest lecture for the public. So here we have Adriel, Afik, Aidil, Anastasia, Arda, Aspahani, Dika, Hajar, and then we have Kansa, we have Faisal, we have Mira, we have Nabila, we have Friendly, we have Saskia, Safa, and Salsa. So uh, that's a quick introduction for our class. So this is, uh, Dr. Joseph Kwan have given me very outstanding uh, curriculum today, but I just give a small part of it. And I hope, uh, Joseph, you can uh, talk more about your participation, about your uh, outstanding uh, activities in outside. 
So Dr. Joseph Kwan received his architectural training at Queensland Institute of Technology and later obtained uh, his master degree in environmental psychology from the University of Surrey, United Kingdom. And he was awarded the degree of doctor of the university by the Queensland University of Technology Council in 2021. And over 40 years of experience in international architectural practice in Australia, United Kingdom, France, and now over 30 years in Hong Kong. And uh, he's also the founding director of UDA Consultants, consultant in universal design and accessibility since 2005, and has been working in the area of accessibility, universal design, and disability for the past 34 years. And previously, he's also as a director of or consultant architects of a Hong Kong government supported NGO as legal aid department. And I think I believe you have a lot of story about this uh, part and member of the Hong Kong government's rehabilitation advisory committee. And he has been the region four director of the Inter International Union of Architects UEA Paris and founder member and director Arcasia Emergency Architects. And he also has authored several papers and articles and invited as speakers in numerous prestigious events. And I believe that uh, from last email from the UEA, you have been accepted as our director again as in UEA from Architecture for All programs. Is that correct? That's uh, correct. Department? That's correct. Okay. For our region four, which is Asia Pacific region. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can share our, um, your experience uh, for, uh, with us uh, today. I think that's all for my introduction uh, for you. So um, I will give times, uh, the times for you, Dr. Joseph Kwan, please. Okay, I will take down my slide first. Okay. Okay, shall I start now? Yes, please. Okay, now I should try this complication always, get it right. I should share screen somehow, right? Press the share screen. For 300 slides, right? Right, that's right. <laughs> and then I shall sh share this one, I suppose. Yes. Okay, are you there? Uh, not yet. Can you see that yet? Yes? Not yet. Um, Is it shared now? No, not yet. Uh, have you put the share screen? Hang on, let me always get this wrong. Let me start again. Okay. Uh, it's, I hope it's this one. Okay, share screen there and share. I, I think, let's see. Yes, okay. it's working right now. Okay, just let me click through. This is make sure it's the right one. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Okay, now what do I do? I just press the, um, I'll just uh, press the flat share. The, the big one? This yes. one? Yep. Hang on. This one? Yes, perfect. And you can see me, you can see the slides, yes? Yes. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for everybody for inviting me uh, today. Um, I'm glad that your the university has decided to concentrate uh, and and your student is to have this particular elective on, you know, in, inclusive design, inclusion. And, and I think it's wonderful that uh, there are students in interested. I know architects are, you know, your all train is architects. Um, you want to be architects and, and we do certain things as architects. And I shall bring you through my presentation to see what we're doing. And there is some very meaningful work you can do when you focus on disability inclusive design. Okay, I know there are, we all want to be big star architects to get our buildings and, and, and things. Uh, printed in magazines, but you know, that's, that's, that's good. I think we all want, always want to do that, but also we need to look at the human aspect of architecture. And this is what we come in. I'm glad I'm able to today share with you, you know, my experience of being an architect working with 30, 40 years in accessibility exclusively. And I'm, I'm the very few people, I think, especially in Hong Kong, I'm the only one in Hong Kong exclusively working on this area of accessibility. And Believe me, don't think, oh, I'm going to be working in this area. It's not very glamorous. It's not going to get myself in the magazines and all this sort of stuff. You can do many, many meaningful things, significant things that that really will help a lot of people. Okay, so let me start 
with that, we can have Q&A later about a bit more, but thank you already for the kind introduction. I'm today being asked to talk about disability, inclusive design in architecture, education, and practices. I try to, try to cover all of that with you today with the 200 of our slides, and, and I, some of them I can go quickly, very go through very quickly with you. Okay. Now, as I said before, you know, we are architects, we're here to design architecture, we, we're part of the people that built, built environments, and we are here to now, this particular aspect, more and more so, we need to look at inclusive built environment, not just built environment of anything, but is, what is the meaning of inclusive built environment? We like to do that through design. Okay, this is what we're trying to do. And I hope you, you at the end of our lecture, you can have a better understanding where we're coming from. And there is glamour in this building for people having responsible architecture. Okay, so you can imagine this. This is obviously not a real building, some photographer play with it and, and and trying to get you interested and say what it's all about. That's not that the purpose is not trying to build a building. The photographer did this. On the other hand, you say, okay, is this a fantasy? Trying to get things done. Every, anything can be done nowadays, of course. You say, no, this is a photograph. But I was wondering why is it now? Look at this. This is what's been designed and built and thought of by many, many architects nowadays, you know crazy trying to build anything that's unusual any shapes and sizes is there any meaning to it my question is is there any meaning to this you see right it's not only fantasy it's actually been built people are building these things building on the left whatever it is a fancy shape environmentally it's sustainable etc building on the right obviously it's got some effects fine what happens rely we're talking about the the, the big energy conference or climate conference now in, in Glasgow, you know, talking about energy saving, etc. So building on the right, you know, there are no windows, there's no power, no energy. What happens? You know, we are running into, you know, issues if we're not careful. And so many architects are trying to build something for this, what I consider a wow factor. Wow, look at that. The building on the left, that high rise building has actually been built in Bangkok. Like it looks like the, the constructive architecture, you know, it's, it's fancy, you know, I'm going to get you, everyone notices that building, but, you know, is this where we're going? And the, all the other buildings have actually been built by architects, you know, trying to say, oh, I did this, this is getting on the magazines, I, I get my name up there, you know, is this where we're going, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of uh, criticizing design individuality, but let's consider, you know, where we're going, and I hope we don't just design buildings for this wow factor to get yourself in the magazine, something silly, ridiculous. And once again, you know, it's, is there any meaning in all this? Is it all just a fantasy? So it's a fantasy that we like to have? These are some of the buildings actually built, okay? And uh, is this the way we should be going? The world should be going. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about energy saving, etc. So this is the, the way we want to concentrate in this. this is, these are two photographs, one on the left, and one on the right, okay? Look very similar. It's got some nice, interesting high-rise architecture. The building, the buildings on the left, it's in Dubai, in the desert. The building on the right, what do you think it is? Shanghai, China. Is there any difference in the style of architecture? Not really, you know. On the left, we're designing, supposedly putting buildings into a desert, hot, arid country, yet, is there any indication? Is there any cultural context? Is there any meaning to this architecture apart from high rise and trying to be fancy as much as we like? And all right, same in Shanghai. That's all trying to outdo each other with different shapes and sizes. Is there any context, cultural context in the buildings in both of these countries? I don't see it. And I hope you as architectural students would do a, think a bit deeper than just building something, you know, to, to, to have this create this wow factor and to get mag into magazines because it looks good and without really any real meaning. And you can, no wonder Prince Charles is coming out and saying, will you agree or not agree with Prince Charles? He's basically saying, eventually, you know, we're building all these uh, boxes that's gonna, that's gonna suck up the energy. And it's, he said that 10, 20 years ago, and now we're actually experiencing. That's why we're having this Glasgow conference that we're using far too much energy, not really conserving what we have for the earth and really, really uh, sympathizing with nature and work with nature. These are a few topics I will share with you today. 
visibility first. We'll talk about some international developments, uh, what's happening in the world. I will show you some what is inclusive design uh, in terms of requirements. We can talk about education and primarily some practice thing, things are really done in, in reality. Okay, we design for people, right? We don't, we don't really design for rich clients to get those fancy buildings. We design for people. So if you as practitioners eventually designing for, this, for people, we look at the people we're dealing with, okay? With the, in this particular case, inclusive architecture, inclusive design is very specific, okay? The, the different, different models. So let's have a look at the very old model first, the medical model, all right? Medical model, basically very simple in the old days. They say there's basically two types of type people, you know, with, with people with disabilities, if you like. People with physical impairment, or physical people with cognitive or intellectual imp impairment. So let's look at the physical aspect. We look at people, if they have any physical disability, they either be paraplegic, which be basically they're paralyzed from the waist downwards, for instance, quadriplegics, which means they're most likely para paralyzed from the neck downwards. Basically, the forelimbs are not functioning. Hemiplegics basically means one side. People with strokes, hemi means one side, left or right side. When you have a stroke, you can be paralyzed or you know one side of the body may not work function for you and of course you have the amputees and of course these people are very much affected you know with mobility and movement and we identify these people sometimes what they use in in order to to achieve mobility of movement they may use a wheelchair they may use a walking stick they may use a walking frame or may, may use a scooter to get around okay so this is one group of people we need to deal with when we're discussing what we call inclusive design, designing for people with disabilities. The other group we talked about are the people with vision impairment. These are either people who are actually blind or low vision, right? Blind, blindness at various varying degrees. And you have low vision, which means you can still see, but things are blurred. That's why you have low vision. And what do these, this group of people need? The thing we need to design for them is communication. You know, how do you communicate? Or how do the, a visually impaired person, a blind person communicate with you, with the environment, with one another, okay? They're very much needed for us to provide them with a nice way of wayfinding. We look at those examples in a minute, wayfinding to find ways. A blind person, get to one A to B. Can a blind person come to your architecture school, go to your, your bank, go to your restaurant? Can they use that properly? Okay, so wayfinding techniques we need to look at. You need to provide good signage for them. You know, for low vision people or color blind people, we need to provide good signage big enough for them, for them to see, the right color contrast for them to see the information that you need. And they normally use canes or wear glasses, spect spectacles, and then uh, they we, they cannot see, therefore they rely very much on the touch and touch. That's why we call tactile. We need information to be tactile for them, okay? The other group of people we may come across are the, the people with speech and hearing. They normally goes together, speech and hearing. Once again, people who cannot speak, then normally cannot hear. And how do these people communicate with you? Communicate with the environment, communicate with the built environment, communicate with people, okay? They will be most likely be wearing hearing aids. In your built environment, you should be looking at building what we call induction loop system. So someone hearing using a hearing aid, using an induction loop system is able to get that information very clear through the hearing aid. And once again, if they really can't, if they're using those, we may provide people with signage sign interpreters, sign languages, and people are actually doing signing so they can use sign, sign um, read from hand sign signals. And of course, the lip read. That's why in the built environment, we need to, where there are people with hearing or speech impairment, we need to have, have good lighting so they can see your light, see, see your lips, or see the speaker's lips so they can lip reading for them. So this, this is the thing that environmentally we need to provide for them. And then a final group, probably the cognitive or the intellectual. Uh, of course, these are like autistics, the Down syndrome uh, people. And of course, how do we communicate with them? Uh, for cognitive impairment, probably a good clear signage that they can clearly understand and using simple things and not too complex. And they can understand if, if this is what we need to communicate with them and vice versa. But this is one way, the old model, the medical model. Now we come up to a new model. Nowadays, this comes out in 2001, the 
the, the medical model has gone go back to hundreds of years. You know, where you know you 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 are disabled, uh, they put you in a wheelchair, you deal with treated somehow. But WHO recently, well, almost 20 years ago now, they come up with a new classification called the ICF, International Classification of Functioning. I think this is the way it should go, but it's more complex because it deals with the person's function. It does not deal with your disability. It doesn't say, oh, you are you are blind, you are deaf, you only have one leg, etc. They don't look at your disability or inability. They look at what you can do. It's a function in terms of a context, and this is an environmental context. So this is a, a combination of your functioning. What can you do? What do you need to do? And how we we accommodate you? So they classify that person in those 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 factors in order to to uh, design for you and build for you and, and, and provide a, uh, daily living activities for you. So the ICF is the way to go. So look into that particular system. It's, it's more complex, but once again, I think we need to do that uh, to, to look at this new standard to measure health and disability. And not just, not, not, not just sort of uh, earmark you as you're disabled, you're blind and that's it. You know, let's, let's look at more broadly. So the ICF is something you should look into. Right. Very quickly into international development. I want to give you the background. Where are we going? And why do I need this? Because we don't work alone. We don't work in Indonesia, Indonesia alone. We don't work in Hong Kong alone or even Asia. There's some in de in de in international development that's been going on for the last decade or so. And let's look at the background, how we can relate to this. And you can quote this to your government, what things, what, what should we be doing? Okay, there are many, many different things like the convention, the SDG, Habitat, etc. So I'll go into details with you right now. The MDG, Millennium Development Goal, that came out the year 2000, right? And when it, was, it came out, there was nothing that mentioned disability and inclusion. So, you know, we in the disability or rehab sector really um, protested and say, you must include us in this development goal, 50 year development goal. So the Y2K plus 15, 2015 decided we must have addressed the shortcomings of the MDG. So we de developed the SDG, right? Sustainable Development Goal. I'm, I'm sure most of you is aware of that now. The SDG, there are 17 goals in this SDG, which are these things, different ones, one to 17. And the one which particular need to deal with relates to us is goal 11. It talks about the sustainable cities and communities. It says we need to make our cities and human settlements inclusive. Look at the word, it's been bringing in the inclusive word in the SDG, inclusive, safe. Of course, must be resilient and sustainable, both of those. But our key word is inclus inclusion, inclusive and safe, okay? Goal 11. And how do you do that? Basically, it says we to make those our cities safe and inclusive, we need to have a, a really Rethink of the way we, we, we build and manage our urban spaces. Okay, so that's SDG we need to look at. That's one big area. Everyone's working on this at the moment. UIA, etc. I'm sure you I hope your country is looking at SDG, how you can implement for us a goal 11. At the same time, in Asia Pacific, we have this uh, forum, get together, if you like, under the SCAP. SCAP is Economic and Social Commission of Asia Pacific. So every decade we get together, we, we, we decide what we need to do. And, and back in, you know, a few years ago, we held a, a, a session, in, you know, in, in Incheon in, um, in Korea. And our motto for the Incheon strategy is to make the right real. Okay, what is right? The right is the right of persons with disabilities. Okay, let's make that real, not just a piece of paper, nice convention, we have, but let's make that real. How do we implement the rights? Okay, so this is our motto for Asia Pacific decade. And once again, to make the right real, there were 10 goals in particular uh, strategy for us. The one that relates to us is accessibility. It's goal three. Basically, we said we must enhance access to the physical environment, public transportation, knowledge, information and communication. Okay, let's get think the word accessibility. Let's go beyond physical environment. We need, I will talk about public transportation in a minute, 
and we talk about big about knowledge, information, communication. So all this is encompassing into accessibility. So this is goal three under the, the Incheon strategy. And you hear it in this particular diagram, we've got Incheon strategy on the left, the 10 different goals, SDG on the right, and you can see the cross correlation between the left and right. It's related to the areas where we can join to the left to the right, you know. The goal 11 connects up with some of the environmental issues and and and, and uh, accessibility issues. So that is very much related. We don't work alone with re related to both particular instruments and documents. The other big event that happened is probably the, the World Humanitarian Summit. That happened back in 2006. It was held in Istanbul. And from that particular event, we came up with five core responsibility, five core responsibility. The one that relates to us is probably core responsibility number three. The motto of that is leave no one behind. And now these things are coming up. Now people, the Americans are actually using this. In, uh, in UIA, you, borrowing this motto, leave no one behind. The, the, the Congress in, in UIA in uh, 2023, I think in Copenhagen, the theme is leave no one behind. And we cannot leave people like women and, and girls, young people, the displaced, people with disability behind. Okay, these are people we must look after. It's, it's called responsibility number three. And then the third big event, I think that's what we met, right? At Habitat 3, Ariana, right? And uh, well, we went to Habitat 3 as well as other things. But Habitat 3 is a United Nations conference. It's held once every 20 years. And it's... It, it, concentrates on, on housing and sustainable urban development. And that particular session, there was a need to talk about the new urban and new urban agenda. agenda. Habitat conferences held once every 20 years. So we were at there in 2016 in Ecuador, and there's a need for this to discuss a new urban agenda because basically um, it says, Everyone wants to move to the cities. Everyone wants to get, move to cities. The population is getting more and more. Urban population now is 50% of the, the world population. Sorry. It's, it's more than 50% of the population. So what do we need to do? You know, do we, do we allow the cities to, to, to be decrepit, to dilapidate? So that was a big thing. And we were talking about the new urban agenda. Okay, so we need to rethink the urban agenda. We need to re-implement the new urban agenda. And basically, you see what there's a number of topics discussed. And once again, the big theme of that is safe and sustainability of cities. During the same time, I think that's where we met, met Ariana was the UN DESA. DESA is the, the, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs out of the UN. And we had the, the high level forum at Ecuador and uh, where we talked about disability inclusion and accessible urban development. And I was fortunate enough to give a five minute pre presentation there. And this is, we're focusing on that. Even at Habitat, we're looking at disability inclusion. So let's not forget it. You know, we are not working by ourselves. We're working globally. Everyone's con concerned and looking into this. And of course, from that, there were some out outcome documents. You can look up the, the website and look up what we're trying to do for that particular uh, outcome document. The convention, I'm sure you should be all know what the convention is by now, right? Few articles we need to take notice of. Article number two, it, the definition on universal design. Look at that. International a convention document has a definition of universal design. That's fantastic. And article number nine specifically talks about accessibility. Article 30 talks about participation in cultural life, recreation, leisure, and sports, which you and I as designers will be providing and doing for our people. Okay, so these are a few articles I'm highlighting. And Going back to the, the convention that many, many people uh, are signatories. Indonesia, you became a signatory to the convention way back in 2007, and you became a signatory to the ratification back in 2011. So these are very many things we need to do uh, under this convention. As signatory of this convention, we basically try to look at how to implement this article number nine. It basically says the aim of that is to enable people with disabilities to live independently and participate fully in life. Very, very simple, right? And we all, states, parties, might need to take actions. 
and measures. And what does it cover? It covers, once again, the words we know by now, equal access to the physical environment, to transportation, information, communication, including ICT and systems, both in the urban and the rural environment. Okay, so we don't only work in cities, we also need to look at our rural community. So we need to identify and eliminate all these, all these different obstacles. So I will go through with examples with you in a minute. We're looking at designing for people. Our, our group, which we are concentrating on inclusion, inclusive design, are poor, of course, people with disabilities. I'm sure you, you should be aware of these figures by now. Uh, WHO came out with a report 10 years ago, basically, basically it says 50% of the population has a disability, it's coming to 1 billion people, and 80% of those living in the developing countries, which a lot of Asian countries, Africa and Latin America are developing countries. 80% of course living living in poverty and yet they have a disability, the, the double disadvantage. So we need to help and do something as professionals, as designers, okay? That's one group of people, right? Huge group. And the other group of people which are not people with disabilities are the elderly, our grandparents, your grandparents, age 65 and above. We are aging and they will probably need, they don't have a disability, but what they need in an environment is very similar to what they need in, as a person with disability. You know, they need accessibility to the built environment, just like a person with a disability. They need better vision, better signage, etc. So the, the uh, you can see every, every the whole world is aging and you can see the trend is that by 2050, 16% of that people with 65 years and above. And look at ourselves in Asia Pacific. At the same time, our population of older people will triple from 50, 500 million to 1.3 billion. And these are people we should be designing for now, right? For the next 20 odd years. We do not design buildings that are inaccessible with barriers. We need to design for this group of people. And these people are aging and these are huge population we need to design for, okay? So don't forget those two groups, people with disabilities, aging population, you put them together, we're talking about almost 30, 40, 50% of the global population. Okay, now we see some pictures. I hope you can identify the barriers I'm talking about. Okay, go. This, I don't think I need to say many things. You can see where the barriers are. If you're in a wheelchair, pushing a pram, these are not friendly environments, right? Look at that, crossing, street crossing externally. Very badly pavements and sidewalk conditions, obvious issue problems. You can't cross the street. There's no drop curb. So, you know, this is the cities we have. You don't cross the street so well. And even our, our so-called pedestrian walkways, there are the things in there. If you're pushing a pram, walking a wheelchair, there are things, obstacles in the, in the footpath. It doesn't work. So a particular city is gentleman because he was not able to use a footpath like everybody else. He's forced to, to push himself on the road. Now, is this the environment we want to build for our people? That someone has to endanger their lives, competing and traveling with cars and traffic. Okay, I hope not. You can see, this is what we find. A lot of barriers, you can see what they are without, without any description, right? Steps in places, steps in hotels, etc. cetera, that doesn't work. And so-called ramp in the hotel, that ramp is very dangerous. I'm sure it's not for people, it's not for wheelchair users, it's probably for luggage, but still very dangerous, so-called ramp into a, to overcome steps. And of course, different heights of things, make things un inaccessible for us to use you know facilities we cannot use many things so-called ramps and built uh, is that a good example of ramp you know to me these are really poor attempts token efforts in building ramps supposedly for us can we all use those ramps no why can't we build better things than these i'll show you good examples of ramps you know in a minute and this is a special school for children with disabilities special schools and look at that there are no handrails the non 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 stip flooring materials, very very dangerous. It's so damn friendly, very poor access, and the choose of pavement material, you know that on the left is certainly not going to be easy for us. And crossing the streets, many many obstacles and barriers you can see in these situations. Getting to a park, you know, already you can I can identify the top four. I got three or four different barriers to overcome before I can get into a park setting. You know why why do we do these for people? Why are we not being equal? For everybody and these silly barriers 
part of poor design. You know, people just, just, just don't think open dish drains. Obviously, it's going to be an issue for people. And the right photograph is a ramp. Go down, and before you get to, get to the ramp, there's a step. So what good is a ramp that, that, needs, that comes to the bottom of a step? You know, these are very poor designs. And for the visual impaired, can you identify where the steps are? Okay, can you see where the steps are? There are many, many steps on the right photograph. Can you imagine walking? Someone with a low vision, grandmother, poor lighting, you can't see the step, you're gonna fall over and trip. There are no handrails to this particular queue steps. So what are we doing? Are you being a responsible designer when you design things like this, not caring for the people you're designing for? Of course, this is inaccessible phone booth, no good. Inaccessible toilet, too small for people. And once again, where the toilets, the hand routes, these are designed so badly that you can't actually get, you can't use a particular grab route from sitting on the toilet. It's too far away. Things are wrong. And look at this. This is what we call, what well, those strips are, are meant to be guide paths for, to guide the visually impaired for blind, to, to for wayfinding. Look at that, putting them right beside a wall, a balustrade. People can't use that. That should be in the middle of the, of the side of a footway or an open space for someone with visual impairment to, to use and follow. That is certainly not someone thinking, you know, why are we building this? Someone's very thoughtless putting those in. Okay, going to the star architecture, star design. I'm sure you will recognize the style of this particular star architect without naming it, you know who she is. I'll already give you a hint, you know who she is. She's into this really architecture, which gives a lot of people the wow factor, you know, interior, exterior, fantastic. But when it comes to accessibility, I would give it probably zero in terms of being user friendly, you know, big, a walkway like this, the flooring surface can be very slippery when it's wet. You can see in a wet situation, very slippery, and no handrails, okay? This is the SAR architecture. Even the interior design is very badly designed, very badly built. Sorry, that, that particular building was actually became the, the Guangzhou Opera House, okay? It was designed almost 10 years ago. Uh, nothing that I would say is fantastic, poorly designed, badly built. This is the interior. I know some of you say, wow, I like this. It's cool to be monotone, you know, black and white. Look at this, black and white. It is pretty cool. You know, I don't want to use the word, you know, they think it's really, you know, yeah, fancy, etc. There's no handrail. So-called handrail can't be used. The left staircase is the right is a ramp. Black on, on white, I can't see a thing. Once again, look at this. Staircases, steps, no handrails. Steps on the left, steps on the right. You can't even see where the steps start, where you can see the start, step ends. So can you imagine someone with any poor your grandmother using that without, without a handrail, walk, use a walking stick. Would you be, uh, would you want to walk down this particular staircase and use it, you know, and, and not fall over and, and, and hurt yourself, you know? And this is the things we want to avoid. I hope you see the star architects doing these star designs, look at it, be critical, what should be done. Okay, let's show you some good examples now. And we look at universal design, we mentioned before, universal design, uh, different words for it. It could be say inclusive design. It's designed for all. It could be called lifespan design because it, it doesn't design just for the young, the old and the middle age, whatever. It's for life, a lifespan. That's why it's also called transgenerational, cross-generation design, okay? Every, every generation can, should be able to use this. And the definition of universal design basically says it's the design of products, the environment, programs, and services to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for ad adaptation or special design. So this is where it's coming from. It was coined by architect Ron Mace back in 1988. I have the pleasure of meeting him in, in, in America and he's passed away now, but he, he was master of universal design. So he, he basically um, came with a number of principles. Basically, universal design is not only designed for wheelchair people either, it's designed for a group of people. And you can see in this photograph, different people who may need of a good uh, accessible environment. And there are the seven principles in universal design according to Ron Mace. Uh, I go quick, very quickly through this one. Uh, 
Uh, you can look up university design. You can download the whole thing in, in, in detail. So I won't spend too much time in, in going through each of those. Equal use, number one, basically your design can be used by everybody, can equally well used. And not only for the young, the old, equally, equitable use for everybody. Flexibility in use, right? Your, your design should be flexible. So, you know, if I'm a left-hander, right-hander, your product can be equally be used just as well. If I'm tall, I'm short, can be equally be used, it's flexible. Not in any specific group of people. Simple and, and intuitive in use. So if something could be simple. I can look at it and I can understand already without complications, without knowing a different language, etc. So look at this example. You, IKEA. You you may know the 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 the, uh, the, the flat pack designer IKEA of Sweden. They're very very clever in providing instruction how to put something together. There is not a word in there. Basically information is there by nice diagrams and charts right you can put that chair together by following the chart simple charts so they can use one universal design one poster one instruction can be used all over the world whether it's china in russia in latin america so this is the way it should be right like this simple information should be easy to understand right uh, not so difficult for someone with sensory disability to understand so something could be easier that to understand information should be easy and like this we can all understand by good pictograms what we're talking about right there's no language there's no indonesia or chinese or, or french or english in there everyone can be able should be able to understand what we're trying to achieve this is information easy achieve tolerance for error once again very easy i'm sure you, all of you have computers tolerance for error in that sense is right the undo button a go back button. If you've done something wrong, I can go back again, undo, I go back, revert back something. This is tolerance error. So you make a mistake, it's not lost forever. So if something, your product, your design has to tolerate, be built in that the tolerance level. Low physical effort. I don't need to be a big, strong person to open a door to move something to do things. Low physical effort. So a, a, a child or a grandmother can be able to open a door and use certain things with a big, you know, op operating forces. And the final one, the sizes and spaces, right? We must have the proper sizes and spaces that we can use, like, you know, what is needed uh, to, to use, uh, to get to a table and for circulation, etc. Okay, so good examples in that inclusive design, very quick examples. That's what it is, should be in designing drop curves. That's some of the examples there. And there, an example of what it should be, people getting across the road without those steps, etc. Steps are a barrier. You can see people can't use them. So what, what do we need? What is a, what can we use to overcome steps? Design of ramps. You know, what is a minimum ramp width? And what is a minimum ramp gradient? These are all available in, in publications and guidelines. Barriers in front doors, right? There, there are posts and things. There are doors. And what can we do? What can we do to overcome this? In especially shopping center, put in automatic doors. That's the solution, universal solution, right? Low physical effort, I don't need to push anything. Automatic door, I go to it, it opens. Everybody can use this equally well. And once again, the spaces that we need to look at, circulation, a wheelchair has a certain diameter it needs for maneuverability, right? You can see that 1500, and people using different walking sticks do also have different dimensions. You need to to, to design to. So these are the things you, 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 you look into designing your spaces, corridors, and, and corridor spaces and turning spaces. Once again, you need to look into uh, it is a design of lift, lift button. Is that too high for someone to, to touch, to call, you know, to press the lift button? Are the lift door too small? The lift size is too, you know, uh, too, too small to use. So there are certain sizes in design of lifts, the minimum size to lift, we can get into the lift, uh, how quickly it should open, how slowly it can open, how the door should be open for at least five seconds before it closes on you. you know? These are typical things you design for, and these are good examples of what a lift design could look like, and the sizes, dimensions you should look into. Steps and staircases, these are steps with no handrails, these are very poorly designed steps, and what you should look into is the type of steps uh, the good examples and the bad examples, the different sizes you need to look into and the different sizes of the handrails. It's very important the handrails, the height, and we adopt the area, the horizontal uh, projection 
beyond the sloping handrail. We, we say there should be a minimum of 300 to the handrail. So a person who is blind can actually use the handrail to say, they hang on the handrail, they follow it. And when it goes down, they know the handrail is going down. Okay, the step is going down. So this is where the, the, the horizontal aspect comes in. We provide that 300 minimum uh, examples in our, in our design in Hong Kong. And these are the examples of it, right? It, it's, it's contrasting color. People can actually see it, easily identify where they are. And of course, we turn that on on a horizontal aspect and make the color contrasting so people actually can see and use our, our handrail fairly well. And the designing of toilets, once again, too small, cannot be used. So many bad examples. And in the design of toilets, things to, to know is basically how do people in a wheelchair use the toilet? They use, they need to transfer. We've got to transfer from the wheelchair onto the WC. The different options of side transfer, a front transfer as illustrated here, or oblique transfer, like a 45 degree transfer. Therefore, that basically dictates what the size, a good size of accessible toilets should be like. And these are many, many examples of but it should be the different provisions put, it, put into a, a, a toilet of different dimensions. Uh, once again, plans and elevations, what needs to be provided into a, a toilet. And these are good examples of toilets uh, with, with different handrails, uh, et cetera, right? Different handrails, different colors, uh, examples of handrails. The top ones are great examples from, from Japan. To me, they provide the, almost a six star toilet. They provide everything available in, in, in their washrooms and, and toilets in, in Japan. Okay, doors, uh, steps and doorways, obviously, you know, thresholds are difficult for wheelchair users to manipulate, to get through. Therefore, we need to design doors that it's gonna be accessible. We need to provide minimum width. We prefer with at least no, no less than 750 clear space. 800 is better, 850 is even better. You know, we should go, that, go down that way. Of course, designing of rooms, et cetera, you need to get to things like a window. We need to clear spaces in front for us, what we call a side reach from the side or front reach from the front. These things you need to consider in your uh, designing of buildings and houses, etc. Et designing bedrooms, large bedroom, manure spaces, etc. A smaller bedroom, the spaces required to get to wardrobes, to get the windows, get to your bed, etc. Designing spaces around the beds, minimum spaces, 900, uh, prefer 1050, okay? and Different types of uh, hanging rails, you know? Do you have one type of hanging rail that's too big? No, these are good examples of a hanging rail for different type of people to use. Designing of kitchen, different type of kitchen for different type of mobility, older person, people using wheelchairs, etc. Different types of kitchen arrangement is gonna be good and easy for you. There's some good designs, good examples there and design a kitchen, even a table, which is can be moved, electrically moved up and down right, to, uh, to help people who are maybe in wheelchairs or when other people use it, that, that could be raised to a, to a different level. So you, there are very many, many different options you can, you can adopt. Designer bathrooms, what is the minimum space you can get to? The WC, you should shower, use a basin. You know, there are many, many good designs available. You can see these in your uh, guides and, and guidebooks, okay? And one poor example is here in this hotel. My friend here going into going into a hotel room, even though he can get to the bed, but he can't turn on the light. The light is put so up, so high, that when he's on the bed, he can't turn on the light or turn off the light from his position. So these are things we have to consider, you know, as architects, as designers, all right? And let's not disadvantage them by our poor design, okay? And once again, the, the uh, in that particular room, not, obviously not designed for, for anybody else, uh, not wheelchair users, can't reach the, the clothes hook, and, on the left, they can't get and use the bathroom. So, so small and tiny. Examples of inaccessible telephone booths. These are good examples of telephone booths. And good examples of accessible counter. There are many, many good designs. You know, it's up to us to design and provide it for everybody. Universal design, that's the way we should go. Different divisions. And when, when we go to dining, we, we, we have to consider a menu in Braille. You know, blind people need to read the menu also. We may provide a, a, a menu in Braille for them. We may even provide an audible menu, right? Menu that reads things out for someone who needs it. We may need to provide a sign language. And obviously we also provide uh, access to guide dogs and, and you know who might be able to, to go into your restaurant and use that sort of space, okay? 
These are good examples now, car parking spaces that can be used to be accessible, you know, the dimensions, et cetera, park a car, get in and out, many, many uh, disabled drivers around nowadays that can drive their own, et cetera, and we need to look into. Now, get into the designing, good examples. You can see accessible, no barriers. People can use this environment very easily. Everybody's using this very nice, clean environment. Once again, nice and easy external environment, crossing streets, wheelchairs, etc. Families can use it, this particular environment. Once again, examples in Japan, they put tactile guide paths, so yellow things are tactile guide paths, pictures of crossing, it guides and leads you, tells you the crossing is, tells you to wait for the audible signals, etc. So these are very well designed out of Japan. And even on their, on their, uh, on their uh, handrail, they have things in Japanese, and things in Braille languages to tell you steps, etc. Toilets, public information, universal accessible toilet, very, very good one this one is. Of course, different languages, uh, the buttons are the right level that everybody can, able to use, able and disabled can use it. Different languages also can use design. Very good setting in, out of Japan, you know, see the guide paths from the, from the railway station, takes you across to pedestrian crossing, etc. You know, you, you have a chance, go and visit some of the places in Japan with a very, very well universally accessible. Street crossings, well defined, well marked, bicycle lanes, pedestrian crossing, etc. Right? Very good design settings. And once again, some of these are examples in Australia, you know, on the left is an example of street signage at a low level. You can read it, I can read it. It's a nice contrast color as well as in Braille for the blind people who, who may need to use Braille to read uh, that information, you know, get across the road. I particularly like the the, the area of uh, 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 speed table. In other words, we raise the level of the road. Therefore, people from a, can cross the street without going down a level. So that's level from left to right, pedestrians crossing, prams, walk wing, wheelchair can walk right across without going up and down. And the cars have to slow down. So the ramps are for the car. Okay, so it's there function is a speed bump as well as a speed table and user friendly for everybody. Okay, this is a speed table you should be looking in developing for your road systems. And people use different mobility aids to the environment. Australia is very good uh, a, a settings and environments. Very nice, easy, good color contrast, and rich road crossing, etc. And even street furniture are designed well, you know, even drink fountain is designed, universally designed, so everybody can use this. Of tactile information to tell you where the where the uh, drink fountain is, uh, drop cut curves, well colored, so you know can still cross it. And provision of automatic doors, that person can actually get out without put people helping them open the doors. And on the right is an example of a drainage system. You know we don't need to step one or two or three steps for drainage system. That is a drainage system which provide access as well as getting rid of water. So that is a very good design in terms of providing access and, and as a flood barrier, as a water barrier. And even uh, sign uh, tactile maps for, for the blind to appreciate the setting, you know, visually impaired people can actually appreciate uh, a, a tactile model and information about the map. Okay, very quickly, inclusive shopping center. Parking very close to where the entrance is, well-marked defined parking spaces, you can see, Parking spaces for wheel, disabled parking as uh, parents or prams. Very good, well marked uh, uh, parking spots for these particular user needs. Automatic doors, no need to say, and wide gates and getting into the shopping center. Even facilities for people, you know, who who who, who may need to shop in, in a wheelchair. Okay, all these little facilities, little fun things people can actually use to go shopping in. Wide gates, people can get into shopping center in and at least uh, the paying counters Australia you can see there are the many many counters uh, checkout counters and you can see the, the logos there these are particular wider uh, checkout counters for people who may need to use them okay and Singapore shopping centers you can see the logos there to make it accessible university accessible user friendly for families everybody can use these uh, shopping centers and good lighting and even the signaling for for parking you know I, I particularly like the idea where he's using a light system. The red light basically means that parking spot is taken up 
a green or blue light means it's an accessible parking spot or is empty. So these are things we can use, adopt into uh, really user-friendly uh, shopping uh, center, car parking, etc. Very nice shopping center in Yokohama in Japan, uh, where there are travel agents. You know, people can use travel agents, wheelchair people, pedestrians use travel. So there's one system for everybody, travel agents. So for everybody to use, as well as escalators. Inside, nice big design, nice big graphics. Uh, people can understand to use. Where there are steps, you, you see the, the way they, they big steps, big wide steps, the use of the handrail, they design the handrails. Where there are uh, steps, there are obviously ramps on the side, there are escalators on the side. Nicely designed uh, lift buttons inside, they're braille as well as uh, uh, tactile uh, letters in, 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 the, in the lift core buttons. And good signage systems and good provisions of different height uh, of our telephones, etc. Nice contrast colors, color coding, second floor is one color, toilets and bathrooms, another color, big logos, uh, pictograms, everybody can understand and use. There's not one word of Japanese there. And I can still use those, those toilets and facilities and even toilets for, for children with disabilities, right? So these are people thinking, you know, with design in mind, with conclusion in mind, and even uh, changing tables for people. And once again, nice contrast colors, and everybody can use these facilities, the use of handrails, etc. Then we talk at transport. We might mention buildings. Uh, I think very important that we design, not any architects, we, you may be able to ask to design a terminal building, okay? Uh, an airport terminal, a train terminal, a bus terminal. Therefore, the seamless interface with the built environment is very, very important in terms of transportation, okay? That's, Seamless, okay, basically trying to say from the train floor outside, there are information available, there are warning, tactile warning, and the, the thing is there should be no steps between train compartment and the platform. That's why these, these slides are, are shown there with good information available. Uh, Japanese train system, very, very good system uh, in the old train stations that are trying to make it fully accessible for people and where it's not, provided by physical activities, facilities that will provide staff to, to assist. These are Japanese systems. This is a system in Japan where basically an escalator system can be converted into a platform. So, you know, whether you're in a wheelchair, whether you need the system, uh, a pram, you can still use that particular uh, uh, escalator uh, for a, a particular function. These are a good design escalator. And to take you right to the uh, ticketing uh, machines, with guide paths, yellow guide paths, so a blind person can actually get their own tickets without asking for people uh, to help you. And the guide path system is taken right through the, the train system from one end to the other. You can see the guide path right down the corridor with good signage maps, right out to the, uh, the lifts and right out to the elevator uh, with braille information. So it's very well thought up system for the blind, the visually impaired, as well as wheelchair users or anybody can use the same system. Okay, bus systems, good, good, good bus shelters are needed. Uh, we have, need to have accessible buses, uh, low floor buses where people in wheelchairs and prams and, and can e usually use the buses equally well. Systems, uh, uh, good bus stops, etc. And I particularly like this system. This is in, in Paris where the, um, the bus stop have these bus stop, um, signals and signs. The numbers tell you which bus number will be wheelchair accessible routes. Number 24, number 27 will have wheelchair accessible buses. But more so, you can see there in the electronic means, it shows you number 24 bus, what time it comes, right? Line 27 will come in 11 minutes or line 20, once again, line 25, whatever it comes in 25 or 11 minutes. So it tells you that information. This information should be available to us. The IT is there for us to give that information out so everybody can use to wait for, you know, um, a, a bus system. Getting in and out of cars are very important that the level should be accessed from the wheelchair to the car. Therefore, the Japanese system of, of, of uh, taxi stands are very accessible. You get right up to, to the taxi, there are no steps from the level of the taxi stand to the taxi, open the car and transfer into the taxi. 
many, many vehicles are now available to make uh, uh, travel easier with your passenger or wheelchair uh, disabled driver. It's available, different designs are available to get into, you know, these are London top taxis uh, available to, to get you into uh, public transportation, public accessible taxis. And with that, you need to have good accessible transport uh, uh, parking spaces for private cars, etc., for you to get in and out of the car by yourself. And of course, uh, paratransit, you must provide the, the, the lifts in the back and then the space to get in, a, in and out of, of the buses uh, easily. And even cable cars are designed now to be accessible, to get in and out so everybody can use the cable car. Okay? Not only wheelchair users, pram, people using prams and family can use a particular car department to use the cable cars. Okay, once again, transportation, accessible. This particular universal access, accessible system in, 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 in Norway, the, the ramp is designed as part of the train. So the conductor can go in and open that, pull out the ramp from underneath the, the train. So everybody can use that, that train car. Very, very good, nice system. Uh, in, in, in Oslo and even compartments in the, in some transports are very easy located places and even washrooms, toilets within that accessible uh, train compartment. This is where we talk about inclusive transportation. You could be asked to design that. You know, we're designers, not only architecture, we, this is all about architecture as well. We're designing uh, for many, many uh, environments, not only buildings, okay? This is part of the designing buildings, if you like. Uh, airport in, in Bangkok, some of you may have visited that. They use a system of travel agents as well as lifts. So travel agents are good for wheelchairs, it's good for uh, luggages, etc. In the design of airplanes, Boeing, when they designed the 787, a Dreamliner, they actually consulted with the Center for Accessible Transportation of Oregon University, designed their aircraft to be accessible. In the airport, the, the Airbus A380, they're designing their airbuses with accessible toilets. Okay, accessible bathroom. So these designs are there for our aircrafts. It's up to your national carriers to order these planes that are accessible for people, right? So make sure you know that they're ordering the right, right uh, accessible airplanes for you for everybody to use. And marine transportation, you know, make sure that is also accessible for everybody to use. And even this little uh, ferry across the Dubai Creek is accessible for for anybody even people be pushing prams for families, etc. Tourism, in terms of tourism, this castle in, in Japan, they made it accessible by putting an accessible lift on the side so people can actually get into and use the lift to the top level. R ramps are provided to get you into the building, etc. So everybody can enjoy that sort of your heritage systems, get into the system, into the building and use that as well. In terms of sporting stadiums, you can see, uh, Sporting stadium can be made accessible, like in this one, when they had the, the World Cup, that particular stadium is made accessible. So everybody is able to enjoy the game with accessible ex uh, wheelchair locations. I'm working on a project at the moment uh, in Hong Kong. We are building this, this particular stadium complex at the old airport. And basically, uh, we are looking at university accessibility into this particular complex. There are three stadiums there where it's looking at uh, certainly um, incorporating accessibility into that and hopefully when it's open in 2023 we can have Paralympic Games, Universal uh, Accessible Games and Asian Games in Hong Kong. I hope you can come visit this stadium. I hope we will build a uh, university accessible to your, to, your, uh, to your satisfaction. So come and visit us in 2023, okay? So talk about sporting, you know, we say People can't do things, they're blind. What can they do? You know, why are we building these things for them? No, I say, it's a blind skier, okay? People can ski when they're blind even. Look at this, who says they can't do things? They're in a wheelchair, they can't do things. Why are we designing things for them? They're not gonna be there to use it. I say, no, you know, they can use it. We have the proper, you know, prosthetics and things to help them. If they have the will, we should give them the right to use these facilities, like everybody else, adult and child alike. There are facilities available, right? Cross country if you want to, get out in the country and enjoy life, you know, equally well. Professor Ariana, I expect you to be in one of those wheelchairs.
going to the back of the Indonesian mountains one day, all right? Take your students with you, you hear? And bring me along, all right? I hope you can do that for me. That's my dream, uh, Joseph. <laughs> it should not be a dream, it's a reality for you, all right? Let's get take your students out there. Look at this, children with or di without disabilities, amputees out there enjoying life. Let's enjoy life together, you know? Don't, don't inhibit them, we inhibit them. We as designers, we as providers, we inhibit people so they can't use places and, and, and children can enjoy places. Design and, and playgrounds, we did this, this playground uh, a couple of years ago to be accessible. So wheelchair people, children can use playground equally well and it's fairly successful. You know, that meant to be universally accessible playgrounds so everybody can able to be able to use this. And so don't forget our children, don't forget our playground to make it accessible. You know, the swings that can, can be used by everybody, can play together, sand pits, etc. no steps, etc. So we can enjoy it, the place, everybody. Uh, environment must be safe. Remember SDG, safe environment. What do we mean by safe? S safety. We get people into buildings. We get people out of buildings. So what happens when, when there's an evacuation? We must design for, e for emergency evacuation, when there's a fire, when there are natural disasters. And of course, the DIDRR, disability inclusive disaster risk reduction. That's what we talked about in Sendai a few years back, right? the Sendai framework, DIDRR. So we must look at getting people out during emergencies, evacuate. And we in Hong Kong must design with these areas of rescue assistance. Where there are safe areas, we must have places, temporary refuge areas to place one or two wheelchairs or anybody can be safe, be waiting there to be evacuated during emergency situations. This is what we have in our, in our conditions, you know, in the safe areas, our safe lifts, this area of rescue assistance. And when we can't have those, where well, we must evacuate people, there are, there are assistive devices that get you down stairways, you know, no other means to get you down, but that's the way to get you down in, in addition to lifts. I think we should look at evacuation lifts. We should really look at, we have so many high rises in, in Asia. We should really look at adopting the concept of evacuation lifts in high rise buildings. I'll have to be doing some research with that. And I hope I can work with you people and how to design something new criteria for Asia in using lifts as high rise evacuation means. Okay, something we can look into. And what we can develop is PEP, a personal emergency evacuation plan. So anyone who uses your building, who may need it, let's develop a plan where we can get you out of the buildings. If someone's working like in your university, someone working in, in an office block who may be in a wheelchair user, who may be a person who's blind or has visual impairment. So we, have, we must work out a good plan for the evacuation plan. So when there's evacuation, where it's a fire, emergency, how do we get them out? So there's a plan, you work with them together. So when something happens, the plan will assist them to get people out of the building safely. Okay, that's PEP, look into that one. And now we're looking at communication systems and assistive technology very quickly. Systems to develop in Japan for pedestrian information and communication systems. ITs, ICT can make us, make the environment easy for us to navigate the streets, for blind to navigate wayfinding in the streets, okay? ICT, sign languages. I hope your, your, your TV programs, information, public information are provided with sign languages. Okay, you can tell me that in a minute, whether you have or not, sign languages, okay? And even on airplane, you know, you have the information system uh, that are broadcast at the beginning of a journey. In this, this, this particular airline, you see on the uh, on the left photograph, there's actually a, a person using sign language, providing sign language to provide that same information for people with hearing impairment. Okay, the same same information. So why don't we have that in our in our, uh, in our um, airplane system or train system? Signing sign signage for people. We have the technology to be able to do that. Once again, Japanese trains, fantastic reading information in Japanese English accessibility throughout on computer trains, very easy. In the use of ATM machines, Japanese have been developing accessible ATM machines a long time ago and uh, to be wheelchair accessible for the blind, for the deaf. Different time systems, different type of cards. Uh, you, you, you have the card, which is gonna be easy for you. You need to have a basic card. You, have, you use a card, which gives you a picture, uh, information rather than, than letter information. You can have a, a sign that 
a card that provide information in the sign language. You can have a, have a card that gives you information in the high contrast, and you have a card that even gives you a, vo a voice guidance. So you can pick up the handphone and they can guide you, use the system. So that system is good for everybody. Whether you're blind, deaf, wheelchair user, everybody can use this one universally accessible ATM machine. Isn't that the way we should be heading? Okay, I think it should be. And of course, once again, Assistive technology is all there for us, provide information, wayfinding system for the blind. Once again, we have these transmitters that can be implanted into buildings uh, that transmit information. Now, that use the use of your uh, smartphones, mobile phones can actually tell you where, you, where you're going. We are, we are developing the, these things in Hong Kong in our transportation uh, uh, network and in our shopping centers. Our blind people can actually use this to navigate uh, within a system, very, very effective. And the Japanese even have Braille in, in their uh, uh, cans and uh, beer cans, etc. And even our, our banknotes, does your banknote, you can tell me in a minute, does your banknotes have, have Braille information on it so that people can actually touch and, and feel your banknotes to have different uh, 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 denominations, you know, there are signage, there, there are banknotes with uh, Braille systems in, in embedded. Okay, Friend, my Japanese friends are now designing, have, have designed, you know, very nicely designed, uh, university designed pen. Look at that. Many, many different functions. One pen fits for all. Doesn't matter what your disability, we talked about the ICF, right? International Classification Function. Doesn't matter what your function ability is. That pen is good for everybody. And he designed this other little penguin pen, right? That can be used by everybody equally well. All right. Now, finally, we're getting into education designing uh, guidelines. I think we'd like to talk about, about on that one. Europe, European Union have talked about this uh, quite a few years back and the, the commission have actually come up with a guideline on teaching universal design uh, from school to practice. They've actually had curriculums and things. So if we want to do that, I think we should have something like that for Asia Pacific. You know, why can't we have Asia Pacific a design for all, you know, a curriculum that we can all universally adopt and use in this part of the world. Okay. North America, I'm, I'm sure some of you know this, uh, Professor at the University of Buffalo, their center, of idea center, inclusive design, environmental access. Okay. They are the ones that, that I'm aware of out of Buffalo. I think Ed, a uh, professor, Ed Seinfeld is, is heading that one. Uh, and did this, this idea center in, at the University of Buffalo designing, teaching university design. Another event, I hope some of you may have been there already, uh, Thailand, every year they have this Thailand Friendly Design Expo. Um, I was invited to, 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 to attend as a participant, as a speaker. It's a big expo, basically a lot of things that they show there uh, on uh, equipment, etc. cetera. Uh, and, it's very, they hold it every year, about November, December, I think it is. So um, they have speeches, they have lectures, as well as exhibitions. And there, other, other schools in Thailand are actually looking at to into university design as well. Thammasat University, I'm sure it's a very famous university out of Thailand. Thammasat University, they have a UD research unit. Okay, they're doing things, they have displayed their, their UD design out of Thailand. Okay, Thammasat University, big university, famous one out of Thailand. Bangkok Patana School, they also look at socially responsive design, exactly what we're talking about, you know, they're looking into this, uh, how to design responsibly, you know, Bangkok School of Design. The one I've been very much involved in, I've been the speaker now for a number of years, uh, this KMIOT, it's King Mong Good Institute of Technology at the Lamlock. And back on university, they actually have, have a UD home uh, uh, demonstration model at, at that Bangkok uh, Expo. And they're, they're teaching UD, this is the, the model they actually built at that Expo. One to one full size demonstration model designing for, for the public to understand about universal design, what needs for wheelchair accessibility, wheelchair design. And that was a very, very um, successful exhibition for them, you know. and. Out of Malaysia, University of Malaysia, I'm also one of their guest speaker, uh, Professor uh, 
Nasiati, I'm sure you may know her out of, out of the University of Malaysia. She is pushing this uh, out, out of the university and she has got now got a Facebook. Uh, you can visit that Facebook design with Ex disability access Facebook, all right? Design with disability access uh, Facebook page. And uh, I'm a frequent speaker for, for their uh, uh, topics on barrier free access. More universally, universal, more universal, the ISO standard. I, I, you should be looking into that one, the ISO standard 21542. Okay, this is on accessibility and usability of the built environment. The first one came out in 2011. The second one, we just revised it and it came out in 2021. Okay, it's a good document you should look into. It's an ISO document. If you don't have a document of your own national standard, look in that one as, as a guideline. Uh, recently up, updated, I was in, involved in the very first one and recently the second one, and that was published um, this year in June. So looking at that document, it's a very good guideline for you to, to, to study. Uh, Singapore have their own uh, access guideline, 2013 guideline from the building uh, authority. And from that, they have to build a UD mark every year. So they have this award system. Uh, so if a building uh, uh, is um, qualified with those requirements that are given a UD mark. So this UD mark is placed in the building. So, you know, it's a gold UD mark, the silver and bronze. So they can put that in front of the building. So the, the building owners can be proud that my building has a UD mark. So I think we should encourage this sort of a, uh, acknowledgement uh, for building designers, the building owners, okay, UD mark. In Malaysia standards now, the, the, the Malaysian standard, 2014 standard, also now use a new word, universal design on accessibility in the code of practice. We in Hong Kong have universal access also in, in, our, in our guidelines. And I wrote the preference for that one back in 2004, uh, pre preference for that. We also have one guideline for uh, external spaces. You can check out our website, this website and download these two documents. All right, the, the, the internal one, which is a bit old now, 20, 204 and 207. Download that from our, our uh, uh, architecture service department. You can download that for, for guidance. So I think it's good, but outdated, but it's still good, you know, as a, as a guideline. And we also, because HSD which is our government department, architecture service department, and they frequently uh, develop a knowledge uh, papers. And this particular one is on universal accessibility. That was done in 2012. Another uh, uh, paper was done in 2016, and so on universal accessible toilets. And more recently also, guideline for uh, elderly friendly design in, in government projects. Once again, these are all downloadable from the HST guidelines, okay? And the Japanese version, we develop, we have provide housing to a housing uh, society. And I helped them with that particular document, UD guideline for residential development in Hong Kong. That is now translated in, in, in Chinese as well as English. So I believe that document is, should also be downloadable from the Hong Kong Housing Society uh, guide, guidelines, okay? And different Institute of uh, Architects have their own UD policies. Australia has a U universal access policy. Same with Ireland. Ireland has a policy on accessibility from the Institute of uh, Irish Architects. We recently, uh, prepared and published one from under UIA. So we now have a UIA guideline uh, on accessible uh, and inclusive uh, built environment. That is also download, downloadable from the UIA website or from our Architecture for All uh, website, okay? And this is really fantastic. A country like Norway can have a national policy that basically says Norway will be universally designed by the year 2025. Isn't it great as a national policy, a country come out and say that we will do that. And I'd like to see, you know, Indonesia come out and say that you will be universally designed by the year 2030 or 2035, whatever. I think we Asia should, should be looking into this and make our Asian cities more universally accessible. I think we as architects, designers and planners and DPOs really should be encouraging the government to adopt this sort of policies. Okay, getting close to the end, I think you, 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 uh, uh, Universal uh, European Commission have their policy, you know, guidelines of when they have public procurement projects, 
they must follow these particular guidelines. So these are also downloadable. We should adopt these as well in, in Asia. So what we're trying to look at is inclusion for everybody, whatever your ability is, whatever the, the uh, situation is, whether you know we're going out with friends, with families, going out for outings, going to places, places should be designed to be inclusive for everybody. And like this, I think you, you may recall this, the Millennium Bridge uh, at London, crossing the Thames, that's designed to be universally accessible. There are no steps. It's just one system. You know, you could say it's ramped. You could say it's a walkway, some path. People cross from one side to the other side. Totally accessible, to user friendly. So that's the way we should be heading, I think. Okay. And the mottos we're talking about is we need to build back better. You know, whether it's disaster, and when it's new buildings, we need to build back better. And we really, really should be leaving nobody behind. Now, these are two things we should uh, adopt as, as Asian Pacific as a motto. Uh, the rest of the world, you know, I'll be, uh, the Americans are adopting the system, you know, they're using our words from, from accessibility world. You know, they're building back better. Um, Americans are talking about using that motto now and to leave no, leave no one behind is a motto everybody's adopting uh, from our SDG, etc. Let's Let's work on these two things and totally basically the end is inclusion this was done you don't know whether you're aware this is a this was photographed a film by a drone in ecuador these are people holding umbrellas and that's what we formed uh, in in ecuador under the habitat uh, uh, three forum and that's what we said inclusion that's what we should be looking at looking at so i think that's my last slide and i should and Close on that one. Thank you very much. I've taken you, you on a very long journey. I've taken all of you, all, all of your time. I'm sorry. And I hope I've spoke very fast, very quickly. So I'll include on that. Basically, I just hope my presentation have shared with you that we should be doing a lot more and we can do a lot more. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. I, I'm, I was quite afraid to stop you because I'm curious with, you know, another slide from you. Uh, it's just like uh, traveling with your slide. I remember um, my first traveling was in Europe and my parents quite uh, curious about whether I'm safe or not. But when, I'm, uh, when, when I was there, it's just like, wow. You, you mentioned about wow things. My wow thing is that I, I become more, uh, more accessible. I become, uh, you know, more free in that country than in my country because I remember when I'm traveling outside Indonesia especially in Japan in Korea or in some uh, cities in Europe because I understand that not all of the countries in Europe or in Asia are accessible is that right uh, Joseph it's just like uh, we have to be careful uh, select which one but they give a lot of opportunities to be more access. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. That, that's a lot of things that you give us. And um, we have, uh, well, actually, uh, we still have time. Is that fine for you? Because <laughs> I said to you that we will finish at 3 p.m. Uh, in your time, it's 4 p.m., right? But um, maybe 30 minutes. Plus, I'm fine. If, okay. <laughs> if you're not all asleep, you're not all asleep. I'm, I'm, no, no, no. I didn't answer questions. Because Yes, and because, because we have uh, some question. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I remember um, a few days ago, uh, no, yesterday we have a conference and uh, we invited some speakers and two of them talking about aging society. And I understand that uh, when we are seeing about the inclusion or inclusive environment, we are not talking about disability, not only talking about disability, but we are talking about more broader uh, perspective including uh, elderly and then women, children, and et cetera. And if you give uh, some slide in the first beginning about wow buildings, which is, I understand, I ever visited some building that give a wow concept without having give a good opportunity for accessible environment. But the other, they also have a creativity in design that also have a details giving uh, opportunities for accessibility that's complete uh, that's uh, that's 
in, in my in my mind, that's a nice remember uh, memory for me, but not that the other buildings, which only have a wow things in looks and in form. So um, here uh, we have some questions. Uh, I I want to share. Uh, I think we have. First, we have Pak Gunawan. Pak Gunawan is uh, one of uh, lecturer in Petra University, and I believe that you knew him because uh, I got your emails from him when you uh, attend one of seminars in Petra University. Uh, Pak Gunawan, do you want to say hi directly or ask questions? Hi, yes. <laughs> hi Dr. Kwan. Uh, hi, thank you so much you. for. Nice to meet you too. Uh, thank you so much for presenting again. And this time, your your slides are more complete. I yes, guess. more complete. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because I remember it's only fifteen minutes, minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, only fifteen minutes, minutes in Petra University, yeah. but here. Twenty minutes. Yeah, Joseph have uh, almost one and a half hours. <laughs> so, so thank you so great. much for your thank sharing. You. I hope our uh, architect association will hear from you and then we'll make some changes. Uh, just two question. Uh, sorry, uh, one is there any universal design course yeah. in Hong Kong? Hello. Okay. Oh, no, 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 uh, association, the architect association. Is there any mandatory universal design requirement in campus or in association in Hong Kong, especially? Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. I think we we do it not as properly as we should be. We, I think, many many countries have to sit for board exams, right, to be to be uh, registered. And part of our board exams, there, there is a question that will ask you about the barrier-free design, for instance. And our universities, well, because we have a code, uh, our students or, or architects, when they sit for the exams, they must study that particular code as well. So that's linked up. We, first of all, we must have the code on, on barrier-free. You, you still use the old name, barrier-free access. All right, so just like the fire code or a ventilation code, they must study that. And there's usually maybe a question on it during the board exam to ask about that. So the, the students, the graduate students must study that. And in order to, you know, uh, to study that in order to, to get registered as, a, as an architect. Now, that's why we, we control that from the, from the board, like the Indonesian Board of Architects uh, control that system, have an exam, you know, with a question. So, so, so the universities also, our university must teach that anyway. Well, not not much, but they some of them do teach that because they, they they study codes and regulation at part of the universities, right? And we have to we we set that up part of the exams. Therefore, part of the board exam board of examination. Therefore, we we sort of mandate them that they know they must know something about universal design, and that's why the profession comes into it and controls the education system, controls universities, if you like. Okay, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you so much. I think it's very clear. Yeah, thank you so much, Bu Arina, for. Yes. So, does it mean that in, in Hong Kong Institute of Architect have a specific uh, examination for code and guideline for accessible environment? Yeah, we do have a code. We do have a code on accessible and environment, right? Yeah. It's an old one now. We're in the, in the, in the process of, of re reviewing and revising it. But just like, the, just like the wind code, just like the fire code, the, the water mm -hmm. code, the ventilation code, right? Architects, they don't have to memorize it. They know how, where to find that information, right. you know? So the barrier-free code, there, there'll be a question on that, you know, mm. basic things. And they must study that at the university. The university will, 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 uh, will run through the different codes with them. And then they, they must, they're, they're aware there's a code of barrier-free access or there's, they're aware there's a fire code, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. In order to design the buildings. You know, otherwise, and then they, they, they prove that by sitting for the board exam. Mm -hmm. And the board exam, we have design papers and written papers. Yes. And mm -hmm. you, can, you can test them on, on both design, you know, as well as written paper by putting those elements into it. So if you don't see an accessible toilet, you know, mm -hmm. that person will fail in the design. If they can't mm -hmm. reply that in the written paper, then they will fail in the written test. 
So we, we control the, the quality of our architects when they become registered, they become qualified architects, come out in the community. We need to protect the public. They, basically, they know what they're doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. so university level certainly must, and, and architects at board level must, must include mm -hmm. designing for the disabled or inclusion. Yeah. Because uh, I, for, for me, I, I haven't, um, you know, have a license for an architect. So I didn't know if uh, there is an exam in our uh, architect unions. Uh, but Gunawan, uh, maybe you can share because I believe you have a uh, Maybe I'm not really the correct person to share, okay. but maybe it, just sharing my experience because yes. in Indonesia, I don't we have not we Much don't have uh, the tight examination like the one that you mentioned, Dr. Kwan. Yes, That's we right. just have to fill up our forms and send our drawings and so on. So we don't really do our uh, chatting and so on. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, I hope uh, this year we have an opportunity to work uh, with EIE, uh, Joseph, uh, and because now I'm one of the member of uh, EIE and also the UEA. So I hope this kind of things that you told me uh, with Pak Gunawan and with us here can be implemented in, in Indonesia, especially. Um, yes, I, I, I think a while back, um, we spoke, we're very close to Shrak Asia with, with the Indonesian architects. And I think we were sort of discussing and advising, if you like, how to set up a board. I think you do have a board yeah. of architects now. You did not have it before. Right? Yeah. So you do have a board of Indonesian architects and that's where the examination exams and things come into it. And that's, it's, that's how the systems are set up. So I'm sure you have a board of Indonesian architects now and it's a matter yeah. of getting that process through to, to the uh, yes. universities and profession. Yeah. Yes. I remember uh, this year I talked with uh, uh, Carlson. Uh, He's uh, our previous uh, EIE head in East, East Java and he said that he want to start that. And I believe that the new uh, head of the EIE also want to do that. So I think this is uh, a good step uh, for us to, to make it more clear about uh, these things. And uh, one thing that, um, this is only my curiosity because you know I live in Indonesia and I live in Surabaya. Um, especially in Surabaya, we have moved we, uh, the government, the local government have been moved into in a good ways, uh, giving more access and giving more opportunities for accessible environment. But in, in the other hand, uh, some of the decisions, just like your pictures, it's just like I can call it as a, a half heart solution. You know what I mean? It's just like um, something that is there, but it's not right. Right. And I'm, I'm quite concerned and sometimes I'm questioning myself uh, uh, who can be blamed? I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, is it the architect? Is it the contractors? Is it us or whatever it, it is? I'm still questioning myself. And uh, one thing that I understand myself that um, it's quite difficult to access, not difficult, but uh, because this is not as one of the, uh, what's that, a main uh, things that we have to do, for example, guideline and uh, code for accessible environment is not the main things in, in, in designing for architect maybe. And we always, uh, we always being asked, especially me, you know, how many people with disability live or how many people with disability uh, visit uh, some public facilities. So they always come back to that question uh, about the minimum numbers of people with disability who can access. So that's why they are not trying to ignore us, but they are trying to be more, you know, uh, real that, you know, I only give you uh, this kind of accessibilities because of the numbers things. But again, um, one thing that I want to highlight here, what, what could we do, uh, Joseph, especially for me as academician, uh, that this is only my steps, uh, giving student for one elective uh, class. It's only elective class and I hope it can be a main, uh, what's that, Bukirami? Not, not elective, but it's just like a, a main, uh, what do you call it? Uh, mainstream. Yes. Mainstream it. Yeah, mainstream. It's just like elective because elective is just like only for 25 students, but 
if this class is become one of the main uh, subject in our department, it will be good. Uh, so people, students can understand about the code, the guideline, and building their empathy to understand more about the peoples. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you've asked a number of questions there. <laughs> First of all, right. I mentioned the thing, you, you're not alone. You know, you don't think, oh, you're in Surabaya, you're in university. You're not alone. I want you, you should be approaching your government. You say, you've signed the, the convention, right? Convention every year, whatever, every couple of years, your government has to give a, a report to the UN. You say, what right. you have done, right? And so basically they have to come up with an accessibility implementation mm -hmm. plan, national one, and before they can give the report to uh, to the UN. Otherwise, UN say, look, you, you've had, we've had the convention for the last 12 years. What have you done? Nothing. They won't accept that. So when it right. comes to your report, that's one way to, to tell the government, like, don't forget that. That's one thing you need to do. Secondly, and that's why I gave you the, the international development. All that will, will come into it, the first of all. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you can talk about the numbers. That, that, I've, people ask you for numbers. How many people are disabled? Why are we doing all this for one or two disabled? That is the wrong way to look at it. Mm, two things yes. I just mentioned. There are a number of people with disabilities, 15% of the population, as I said. You include that with the aging population. They are not disabled, but they will need, they will need an accessible environment. Let's not look at their disability, like we said. Let's, you know, what are you providing for me? You know, I'm an older person. I need to, I can't see so well. I need a walking stick. You give me all these steps. You need, give me a bad ramp. You give me a small door. So let's look at all that. So we're talking about, as I said, the statistics, the numbers. We're talking about 30 to 40 percent of the population. So don't tell them it's one or two people only. It's 20 or 30 percent. That's why I'm giving you these figures. And you can tell your, your people that, do the research, tell the government we have more people. And why don't you see them? The big question is, I can say, your, your environment is not accessible. Your transportation is not accessible. That's why they're not out there in the streets. That's my question, that's my answer for you. Mm. That's how it happens everywhere in the world. That's yes. why we're pushing yes, right. for accessible environment. That's why you see, you go to London, you go many places, people are running around in their own wheelchair by themselves, mm. enjoying themselves or with family. That's why you don't see them. That's why there are many people, nobody uses buses, right? Your bus is not accessible, I'm sure, right? You have no yes, accessible yes. taxis. You have no accessible buildings. You have no accessible shopping centers. You have no accessible theaters and cinemas. So why are my people? You, why, why don't you not see anybody? It's a chicken and the egg. You give me an accessible environment. That's why you don't see people. You make it accessible, we will come out. Okay, that's, that's, my, that's my answer to, to the people to, to do, okay? Yes. That's uh, what I want to uh, say as well. One of the things that we have to work together, uh, that's, uh, that's the main things. So before I move to another one, uh, anybody can, maybe you can uh, ask question because I see here, it's not only for our students, our students only 20, but we have uh, 58, it's supposed to be about uh, 60. And here, uh, I saw some students from uh, postgraduate student, but also from NGO and uh, some student from our previous class. Uh, anybody? Come, show your faces. I don't see your yeah. faces. I didn't see myself. Where are you? You're <laughs> shy, are you? Come on, let's see your faces. <laughs> I want to see this is, this is one of the negative myself. things. Yeah, this is one of the negative things as uh, having hey, oh, online. Now you're, out, now you're coming alive. Now I can see you. Come on, I want to see your faces. Great. Yes. Don't be shy. Bu, Bu, yeah, Bu Faiz, can you uh, move to a uh, slide with which we can see all of the people here? Because Wonderful. I only yeah I can uh, I only uh, see the highlight of the Joseph Kwan. So ask me your questions, or share with me, give me your comments. What's yeah. not right, what's not wrong? You know, uh, what I say is not correct. You, it doesn't work that way in Indonesia. Let me know, let's discuss it, let's be open. Yeah, because I, I, I hear we have also uh, some uh, people with disability as well. I mean, uh, some friends here or maybe student because uh, I have already given you some uh, previous class about universal design and something like that. So please uh, give a questions. 
we have one question actually in the chat box, uh, Bu Arina. Okay. Yes. Can yeah. you can you uh, uh, share it, uh, Bu Fardila? Because I couldn't see my chat box. Sorry. Okay. Well, this is uh, the next question is for Arda Sari Syahputri Hidayat. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, Arda Sari, uh, would you mind to uh, um, ask your question? Ask your questions? <laughs> Or, or maybe uh, you just want to be uh, read. I think it's good we can hear Arda voice. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry because my uh, bandwidth is low, which is the internet is not too stable, but I hope it yeah. will. It's okay. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Kwan. So I have a question related to inclusive design. So uh, from what I know so far, that to attain inclusive design, uh, there are some alteration to existing space to manifest the inclusivity itself so that it can be accessible to all. Uh, so how far the inclusive design will interfere in existing conserved buildings like for example the temples or the other cultured buildings that they have their own values that cannot be changed uh, mm -hmm. according to your opinion is it still possible to reach an inclusive design to that kind of building thank you so much once again thank you very much yes i that's a very good question and it can be done. I don't have enough slides, otherwise I'll be spending three hours talking to you or, you know, <laughs> in heritage building, that's that's the other area, right? Where there's many, many topics. So, so don't, don't, one thing first, you people are interested, don't think, oh, I mean, this inclusive design so small, so narrow, you know, whereas my friends are designing big multi-story complexes, big stuff. I'm doing this little bit of inclusion for this disabled family. I'm not doing very much. No, you can be much broadened. So accessibility, you can look at accessibility. I said, I'm doing a sporting stadium now, right? So I can be involved in a sporting complex, a big store sporting complex. And you can also be involved in designing for the heritage building, the monument buildings. Okay, so there's, there are all types of niche, you know, churches and temples and, and, and whatever, and there's shopping centers, you know, di different accessibility and, and that sort of aspect. So you're right, temples and religious building, we need to respect the orig originality of things, but you can still, it's a speciality, very speciality. You need a very sensitive architect to do that right. And there are many, many different solutions, right? Uh, without being making it stuck on or making it look clinical or something like that. So depending on the type of temple, you can still do things that could be temporary, that could be removable, replaceable, or integrated. Like that example in Japan, even though it's not quite, you know, the, the, the example I show you in Osaka, that, that temple in Japan, even though it's a temple, they put a lift around, they try to integrate that, that aspect, the architecture, you know, as looking a bit like the, the, uh, the, the, the castle, the Osaka castle. Okay, so it can be done. It's a speciality. There are not many, 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 many accessible, accessibility architect who works in heritage. There are a few in this world, but not many. And like I said, it, it's, it's very specialized and it needs a very specialist, sensitive architect to do it well. I've seen it done badly. Of all places in Taj Mahal, you know, in, in India, that's a beautiful classic building and somehow people interfere with it and they made it so bad, so ugly that it turned, turned me off, you know, and I'm sure that gives people an excuse. Say, look, you guys are trying to build in something. Look how ugly it is. Why are you making my, my, my temple of Taj Mahal environment outside so ugly, so, so so awful, destroy my architecture just to get you into the building, you know? So, so that was done by a very insensitive architect, no idea what architecture is all about. And that's why it was done. And I, I hope that I take that ramp away and, and do a nice one that integrated, that looks like the part of the building, not something that's stuck on a, a metal ramp and that's a, look out, out of place. So it can be done. Inclusive design can be done in temple buildings, heritage buildings, and different architecture, okay? Does mean that, that that's the art of being architects? Of course, that's the architect. That's where the architect comes in. That's art and architecture. Yeah. All right. And, yeah, having a solution because I think the historic building, uh, religious building, is quite uh, challenging. For example, uh, 
giving an accessible environment in that, is that right? Especially when it, it has been built, it will be more difficult uh, to give uh, another you know, renovation despite of a new buildings. Is that right? No, I, I think it's, well, depending on what you need to do it, put into it, you know, it's going to be a ramp, it's going to be a, a lift, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in Thailand, we, we saw an old building and they integrated lift into it and they put, the, you know, they embellish it with traditional architecture. So when you see it, it doesn't look like a, a glass elevator. It's embellished mm -hmm. in the traditional, you know, your, your cultural uh, architecture. Okay, so it can be done equally well. Don't worry. I think that's where architects come in. Otherwise, you're a builder. If I can put in a ramp, you can put in a ramp, right? Try some concrete on the floor and it's a ramp. That's a builder's work. That's not an architect. Architects doesn't do that. I hope you are, as architects, the more creative. You can think out, outside the box. We're not builders, we're architects. We design things to suit the environment, how to integrate a good access, whether it's going to be a step, a ramp, or whatever, handrail into traditional architecture, into a cultural building. Okay? That depends how good you are as an architect, not how good you are as a builder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or um, can I can I give uh, one of uh, here? Uh, I think some students or maybe us uh, always see disabled people, elderly, it's just like the the passive agents or, or the passive people. Also, we always see that as a constraint. You know what I mean? But sometimes we have to change our mindset that uh, we are a, a active persons that we can be more you know, flexible, we can be more adaptable, even though we have a limitation in a certain ways. And I think uh, one, one thing that uh, the architect designer want to do is to understand about their limitation, to understand about their flexibility and adaptation so that we can have a good proposals for our design. It's just like talking, not only talking about RAM, LEAF, that's just like not a massive or not, not, not massive, but a passive solution, but I think we can have a definition about what is RAM, what is LEAF. Excuse me for a moment, I'll be right back, excuse me. Okay. Ya, yeah, uh, silakan adik-adik, teman-teman uh, bertanya, dalam bahasa Indonesia juga boleh, nanti uh, kita bantu untuk uh, share ke Yosef. Jadi, uh, kalau menurut saya banyak sekali pengalaman Joseph gitu dia sebagai seorang arsitek tapi menurut saya uh, dalam melihat setiap detail lingkungan uh, sangat detail gitu. I just give a clue for the participants here that you know even though you are not disability with, with disability but you have a give very details explanation and very details uh, condition which is not comfortable which is not accessible, which, is, which, which are comfortable and which are accessible. So, okay. Back to my question, uh, Joseph, can you give us uh, some information about that? Sorry, about inclusion. It's, it, inclusion, it goes beyond ramps and staircases. Yes. And lifts, okay? I think how, how can we extend our uh, creativity? When we are talking about disabled people, when, when we are talking about elderly, so we are not only focused on RAM and LEAF, because uh, I always talking about, uh, not, not talking, but I ever, not only uh, for the architect, but also for people with disability, they, they, they just only think about, okay, as long as there is a RAM, it's fine. Even though the RAM is just like very steep, but my understanding is not like that. Uh, I think uh, the architect, the designer, have to be more creative. Uh, I mean, creative is not, you know, uh, having a RAM but without any standard, no. It's just like you can have a RAM as an aesthetic aspect, for example. You can highlight the RAMs and you can highlight the, uh, what's that, the, the, uh, the guideline, uh, the guide, uh, the, the what, what do you call it? Um, the tactile, the tactile. The tactile, uh, yeah, the tactile, the tactile. Pass, yes. Yeah, it's just like uh, not for the things that it's just like normative, but it can be more creative. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. We as architects, right? You, yes. 
you people, when you when you graduate as architects, you are you have a task or role of designing for people, okay? And people, your particular client has a certain ability or disability, if you like, certain things that he or she cannot can do, or a family, right? You as architects should be able to come up with good ideas uh, and just go beyond doing a good ramp, right? I'll just show examples to you just you now. Very simple thing, a house. How do you design a house that's going to be usable for family with someone who may be in a wheelchair? My grandmother's in a wheelchair. So what do you do? You're going to design a house for me for that, right? She's going to mm. be able to get into the door. Got nothing to do with a ramp. She's mm. going to be able to get to the kitchen, get a drink for herself. She's going to be able to get to the bathroom. She's going to be able to get to the, to the bedroom, mm. the patio, the dining room. So you're designing a thing that's going, a, a, a building that's going to be useful for a grandmother in a wheelchair, able mother, able father, three grandkids, a little baby. All right. So we're de designing. So you're not designing ramps or wheelchairs. That's not inclusion. All right. Design mm -hmm. for that. And that's only one setting. That's only a, a domestic setting. Residential. Public housing is different, right? High rise office block, something, right? You have a multi, multi, cultural multi type of people going into the office building, all sorts of abilities. And you, I'm going to ask you to design a building that includes my people and don't exclude me. And that's not asking you to put in a ramp. I want a universal building. I don't, I want a lift that's going to fit me and everybody else. You know, I don't want a lift in the back room that's going to I'll share the, share the, share the ramp with, with goods and, 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 uh, and rubbish. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to de design a museum that's going to be accessible for everybody to use, right? Okay. So there's, there's, there's no limitations. We're not designing for just one person or one, one person or just the ramp. The, yeah. the accessibility is beyond the ramp, it's beyond yeah. the lift. That's right. Okay, you guys are there to design everything. <laughs> designing a hospital, anything I'm throw at you, you make it inclusive for me. So these are the things you gotta think about. Include all those people to get into your building. Otherwise you're gonna be excluding all those people. All right, I can, so any a transport terminal, an airport, a railway terminal, bus terminal, you make it accessible for me, inclusive for me. All right. Hotel. I can give you so, so many things. So then next project, pick a pro, pick a topic, make sure you're university design, and I'll give you a crit, okay? And see whether it is accessible, a university inclusion or not. Okay. So don't don't think outside just the ramp and the uh, the lift, okay? Yeah. So inclusive environments, not only for RAM, but it's beyond for that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Is there the question from participants, students? I think it can be your own experience, your own uh, wondering, your own curiosity, anything. I see in the question there, there's someone asking about the uh, unsloping site, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because, we have uh, to take Sorry, just that because uh, my slide, uh, my Zoom is just like a freeze, so I couldn't uh, see. Uh, Bufa is, can you help me to read the chat box or Bukirami? I can yes. see the chat box. Okay. Bukirami, maybe. Uh, okay. Yeah. But uh, the participant uh, didn't put their names, the real names. So uh, just I want to, <laughs> I want to uh, read uh, her yeah, can you, can Maybe you can ask uh, who had that question for yeah. the participants. Who Anyone? is E1? <laughs> uh, me, me. Okay, okay, please, E1. E1. No, um, no, E1. Oh. <laughs> okay. They put a uh, quote. Okay, please, you can ask question. I hear your voice, right, uh, okay. Joseph? Yeah. Uh, thank you for presentation, Dr. Puan. Uh, I want to ask some question about uh, how we design a building on a counter land, especially here in my, in my place uh, in Bandung, Indonesia. There is some area that have a slope like above a 10%. Mm. Uh, for example, to accommodate the needs of people with wheelchair or elderly, uh, we don't uh, cut too much counter of the land because uh, we are in architecture is uh, have a mind to manage uh, uh, a little damage to the contour to the site, but mm. have uh, more impact to improve the building uh, uh, function 
like uh, is there any use of RAM to accommodate any therapy rehabilitation building in slope site? Uh, yeah, it's it's always there's always an issue with slopes. You know, the sloping site. You know, where you cut and fill, and and of course, when when there is a, a slope, you know, obviously a thing or different levels anyway. Different levels, you would start thinking of maybe lifts and ele elevators. You know, I, I know that lifts and elevators can be expensive. There are some inexpensive ones now. You know, they're not the the ones that are built inside buildings. There are there are, there are lifts that are. Uh, light duty, not heavy duty ones, right? Inside buildings. So sometimes you can do that and even do that very cheaply. You can design your own lift to get you from level, you know, from different level as in the building. Okay, uh, rehab centers, depending how big it is, because once you put in a ramp, you're right, one in, one in 20 ramp, one in 12 ramp, it's gonna take a lot of space in, in, in a rehab center or in, in an office park. That's why we don't have big ramps in, in, in downtown buildings that, that big, you know, we have elevators and lifts. And you need to look at the, the, the what what is required and and look at the uh, economics of that. You know, if you have the land, certainly build an external ramp. You want build an internal ramp. If you have that, have the space. If not, the only way to do that probably is it's an it's a lift, an elevator. That's that's all we have, right? At the moment, that's the only way we get or steps which you can't use. But some people can't use, you know, vertical different levels, either steps or vertical lift. That's about it, or or ramp. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Dr. Paul. Thank yeah. you. I think we also have a lot of technology about that, uh, right, uh, Yosef? Uh, so, for example, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's getting to be like the technology nowadays that... Uh, uh, it's, what, what do you call The that? IT, the, the robotic stuff, you know? It's, yeah. I'm seeing a lot of this stuff where you strap on something to your mm -hmm. body and you start walking again, you know, you see that. It, it, it's coming and it's they, they're expensive at the moment and not everyone can use it you can have wheelchairs that can actually climb stairs you know <laughs> okay. that, that sort of stuff you know that's that's that there are many solutions like that uh uh that can if you like overcome it and i don't want that to i don't want that to substitute a nice accessible building you know i don't want to say mm -hmm. oh, why don't you go go buy a, a wheelchair that, that climbs stairs then we can do without ramps you can we can just provide steps all over the place you can buy these expensive uh, bionic suits that, that walk up the steps, et cetera, you know. And that certainly is one solution, but that's not the, the solution. I think we still need to look at the building environment to make it, you know, user-friendly for everybody and not, not have, you go the other way, you're designing something or providing something for that person only, mm -hmm. right? That bionic suit, it's only for that person to get up those steps, right? Whereas the building is a public building can be used by everybody, right? Or that electric chair that's, that climbs steps is only good for that, that one person. So we're talking about specializing for a person. That's not the way we go. That's not universal design, right? The solution, definition of universal design. Yeah. Technology is there, but it's uh, IT is there. It, it, has its, it has its good purposes, it has its functions, but I think we need to be careful, not let that part of things take over our building. Not, we don't get lazy and, and provide something and it's like, right. they can do that. And, you know, we can become lazy architects, you know, let the IT, the, the bionic man take over, you know, we need to provide anything, you know, that, that's not the way it should go. Yeah? yeah. So we have to challenge our creativity first, and then we then, yeah, uh, took the technology to help us. Exactly. It should be there to help us, not, not to replace us. Right. Not right. to replace architects. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Another question, maybe? Because I believe that uh, Joseph is an architect and you have already uh, have experienced a lot of uh, projects, small and big projects. So, Yeah, if it, if, in terms of projects, once again, you, if you're interested in this area, you're, you're, you don't, don't think you're going to stuck, you know, designing wheelchair for people, wheelchair houses for people all your life. You know, it's much broader than that. Your portfolio can include many, many things. In addition to designing building, because I built up a number of years expertise, I become what they call an expert witness. You know, because of my expertise, I can provide, I can write uh, expert reports mm -hmm. for lawyers, you know, who may be fighting a case for someone with a disability. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've written probably three or 400 legal reports for, for lawyers and solicitors in legal cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also provide reports for, um, expert reports for well equal opportunities commission 
who re requires reports. And in terms of projects, recently, I just finished a, a pretty big project, if I, a six year program mm -hmm. in retrofitting, in modernizing 180 shopping centers in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. right? So these are projects you people can, can be part of, you know, just not only designing little houses, you know, small things, it goes into everything that you can look into. You know, as your city develop, as your town develop, look at your shopping centers. Go and do, do the access audit of your shopping centers and see what needs to be done. Go and retrofit that. That's a, that's a nice project for you already. Yeah? Look at the hospitals. How accessible is the hospitals or hotels? You know, mm -hmm. these are many, many things um, you can do in projects. And like I said, the biggest one I have is this big sporting stadium. Mm -hmm. which I'm as a consultant architect on accessibility. So there's no, there's no limitation. If you're mm -hmm. interested, there's work for you to be done. Yeah. Okay. So it, it means that uh, it can be a chance for us. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, for architects uh, to move into these topics. I mean... Into this field, into this area. There, there is work, yes. There's work to be done, you know. Don't think you're going to, going to be a rehab architect, working in hospitals only, working in rehab centers only. You can do many, many things. Okay, I see a hand raised there. Yes, please. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hi. Bufarila. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Kwan. Um, it is very interesting uh, when we discuss about uh, how to extend our creativity and think beyond the rules of inclusivity or universality in our environmental design. Um, what I want to discuss is about the color code, maybe, <laughs> and its role in an interior uh, to provide guidance to the visually impaired, especially for low vision. Like me, at this time, <laughs> my eye condition has just experienced visual limitation, uh, so that's why I'm not uh, on camera <laughs> right now. Uh, uh, currently, I only use my left eye because the pupil of my right eyes my right eye is inflamed and it's predicted will be happen up to two weeks later due to the prescription I consume. Uh, well back to the color code <laughs> sometimes uh, we found the use of yellow color in the environment of inclusive design <laughs> and I feel that the yellow color is indeed very contrasting and, out and outstanding when we apply it in an interior or exterior of the buildings. Um, we often use these colors. Uh, we often use this color to show some spaces that have been marked uh, for low vision, like me today, <laughs> to show some spaces that uh, no. Uh, 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 well, we often use this color to show some spaces that have to be marked for low vision, uh, such as blend tactile, maybe, or signage, for example. And sometimes, um, on the other hand, the use of green color uh, as a green screen, for example, becomes our reverence to help us put a virtual background when we are doing virtual meetings, such as uh, this meeting because of the kind of green color uh, are rarely used in our daily life, maybe. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, this is, uh, uh, these two colors is uh, usually used uh, for showing the contrasting way in our design, maybe. Uh, but my question is, how you determine the right contrasting color in an interior that is very user-friendly, especially for low vision, but we can still make it visually appropriate match for our design. I mean, maybe you could give an example or guidelines maybe about some project related to this idea to, I, to extend our creativity, of course. <laughs> maybe, uh, is there any guidelines to show? Uh, we use another color uh, more than just using yellow or green or any other contrasting. <laughs> One, but it's real, uh, but it's still a uh, uh, appropriate match for our design. Right. That's yeah. Good. That's a good question, also. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The color aspect is that's that's also it's a it's a specialist area. Okay. You mentioned the yellow. Why is it yellow? Because 
authority, probably ISO, uh, has done this research study to find out that, that yellow that we see, that's why we got yellow crossing. That is the color that, that even any, that, that was highlights the hazards of whatever, the best. That's why yellow, that bright yellow, you know, I've seen in, in some of my slides, that bright yellow has been used. But architects don't like to use yellow alone, you, you see. Mm -hmm. And of course, there, there's, there's variations. There's two things we need to consider. Uh, color blindness, you mentioned something like that before. Color blindness, people, people can see. People sometimes are good at one color, not good at others. So if you're going doing a, a, a public space where it's going to be a hospital or something, you discuss with your clients what, what their needs are. And you can, there's, there's color charts, color ranges, which is acceptable. You know, the, what we call contrasting colors, right? Very simple example, contrasting colors, white and black. You put them together, the contrast is what? 100%, right? Black mm -hmm. and white, 100% contrast. Size. There's this range in between. They're also the, the spectrum of different colors that you can match them together and still give you the color contrast. It could be a purple or green equally well. That, so that, that's what you want to do for you, okay? So that, like I said, study the, the, the color charts. What are the contrasting colors? What colors that suits you? Um, and then you can match them up. And that is a very specific topic. And maybe signage people, uh, graphic people are more in, into that more than architects. But once again, engage somebody. If you're doing something, you know, make sure that that graphic designer or, or, or a signage designer is a, fully aware of you're designing a building, signage in a hospital, a signage in a, a special uh, uh, a home for the, the old blind, uh, a home for a residential home for the, the low vision, for instance. So that's when the color comes in a lot more. Otherwise, you know, just take the simple concept of black and white, 50%, there's a lot of range in between. You can use that a mix match of colors and as long as you get the contrast color, that's, that's what it is. It doesn't have to be black and white or yellow and green, all right? Yes. Did I answer that question for you? Bu Faiz, I think Bu Faiz also have a problem with the connection. Okay. Yes, uh, about the colors. Uh, I think uh, last week, uh, three weeks ago, when I give you an information that we also invited some uh, friends from blind and visually impaired, they tell us that, uh, especially not for uh, totally blind, but for visually impaired, uh, they, they still can see light. They, they still can see some uh, colors. But it's just like uh, a different contrast colors. They can see that they, they still can recognize. But again, the definition of red, yellow, is not really uh, important for them. It's just exactly. Like, yes, contrast yeah. colors. Yeah. Right. For for some people, all they see is different shades of gray. Right. 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 Black and white and different shades yes. of gray. They don't see the colors. That's why. Yeah. So by putting two, just for, for the, forget the colors. As long as you get the color contrast we say minimum 30%, the two grays, different, 30% difference, that is already been, can be read. Right. Okay, that's it, yes. right? So we have to be careful as also. Uh, Very using careful, colors. Yes. the colors that you choose, you, you think, oh, it's, it's, you think it's gonna be, um, you think it's gonna be good con color contrast, in fact, it's not. Uh, mm. Very, very easy way to, to, uh, to do that is if you have a, um, something, a color photograph, for instance, um, mm. uh, a color photograph, take a photocopy of it. Mm. So it becomes black and white. Yes, yes. Okay. Like that. <laughs> Whatever. Really... Okay. Right? Yeah, that's then, okay. then you see the color contrast. Yes. Right? Just take a color, black and white color, color copy of, of your color photograph or color graph. And if you see, all becomes one shade of gray, then the color contrast is not good. Yeah. Right? How is this color contrast? That's not bad. That's this, this says good color contrast. So you yes. don't have to Okay. That's why I, I, I give a poster in a black and white because it's quite easier for uh, friends who have a visually impaired. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> sometimes you think of you know green may go for blue you know pink and red sometimes you think it's color contrast but when you take very simple take a photocopy black and white color copy it's all one very similar color then the color contrast is not there okay yeah that's right okay uh joseph we have uh 40 minutes more actually from 3 uh, p.m and i think uh, this is the end and i hope uh, next time we could invite it again in another occasion because uh, as i remember next year we will have a conference and i believe that uh, yesterday uh, our uh, head of department uh, proposed talking about inclusive design so i hope uh, next week uh, we will have another sessions and of course i will keep in touch with you because i promise to be more active in this uh, talking and uh, what i understand about this is that uh, we have to learn more we have to sharpening our understanding and experience into more empathy and one thing is that um, talking about inclusive environment is not only learning from the code and from the guidelines is that right uh, Joseph. So we have to learn from the other people. We have to learn from people with disability. We have to understand for the elderly children and women. That's uh, something that I want to give uh, my students, how to become uh, more understandable with the empathic environment. So Absolutely. that's uh, one of my <laughs> highlight here. And thank you very much for your time, uh, Dr. Joseph Kwan. It is an honor for me, uh, you to be here. And thank you all the participants. I hope you also join us again in the next sessions, maybe. And hope we can meet again in the real uh, world, not in virtual meetings, Joseph, in the next time. Uh, I think I will end this meetings. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I will close uh, the meetings. Uh, Bu Kirami or Bu Faiz, can you help me to close this meeting? Thank you, Joseph. Okay, thank you very much. I hope to see you all in, okay. in person as see well. Right? Okay. okay, see you all thank you. again. Thank bye bye. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.